Hello again, everybody. Scott Casper, Takedown Media. Our coverage of the sport takes us to a very unique place, indeed, the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Our guest on the Nike hot seat today is Chell Lindgren. Chell is an astronaut, and he joins us now. Chell, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm excited to be chatting with you. And to be correct, I should identify you as Dr. Chell Lindgren, and you are the keynote speaker for our NWCA convention coming up July 29th. That's Looking right. forward to it, Chell. You come back to the sport of wrestling. Uh, I think Brian Hazard helped to facilitate this, but what are you looking forward to most? Just kind of acclimating yourself back in with a whole bunch of wrestling coaches and wrestling aficionados? Oh, absolutely. I'm excited to, to kind of hear where the, the sport is right now. Um, wrestling was such a huge part, really, of, uh, of high school and, and even a little bit of college for me. Uh, and I think really form the foundations of um, of uh, a competitive spirit and uh, tenacity and and definitely built a lot of uh, character in the wrestling room as well. Can you compare wrestling and the work you put in to the work you put into becoming an astronaut? I mean, I've heard it say it's thousands and thousands and thousands of hours to prep for a flight into space, let alone the duties you must perform there. You know, I think that there are a lot of uh, important comparisons that can be made between wrestling and, and the opportunity to fly in space. It takes um, hours and hours of training. It's uh, just a diligent uh, training every day, um, just taking small steps toward a goal uh, to ultimately getting to a point where uh, then all of that practice, all of that training comes into play. And uh, so, one, you know, we spend several years training for that uh, that first mission to the International Space Station and then once you've you know once you get up on top of that rocket then it's game time and from the time that you launch to the time that you land um, you're putting all of that training all that knowledge all of those skills that you've developed over time you're putting those to work um, and uh, trying to execute in the best way possible um, to fulfill the mission, to fill all of those tasks and activities, to conduct the science and research uh, that we have to do on the space station. And, and just like all the, the time that you spend in the wrestling room comes down to those few minutes that you spend um, out on the mat uh, in competition. And, uh, and I mean, so I think there are some great parallels there. When on the International Space Station, you're how many miles above planet Earth? So we average between uh, 220 to 250 miles of altitude above the Earth. We're traveling at 17,500 miles per hour, five miles per second. We go around the Earth every 92 uh, minutes, uh, which provides for a spectacular view of our home planet. Oh, it's, it's got to be amazing. And can you see your house from here? <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, I couldn't see my house, but I could see my neighborhood. And I actually snapped some photographs. Um, we looked through both the... Uh, the scientific window in the U.S. laboratory, and then also you see behind me um, a photograph of the cupola, and this is our seven bay window that faces down towards the Earth, and uh, and it provides for some spectacular views uh, as well. Given uh, your career, I got to believe there are still some surreal moments. Yes. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, I look back on the time that that I spent on the space station, and that already feels very surreal to me, uh, almost like a dream. And, uh, but it was a spectacular experience and one that I, am, uh, I will be eternally grateful for. Dr. Chell Lindgren joins us. Chell, you were born uh, not in the United States, correct? That's right. So I, am, um, I grew up in a military family. My father was in the Air Force. And uh, so I was born in Taiwan. We lived in the Midwest for a few years. And then I grew up in England from my third grade till my freshman year in high school. Um, and then finished high school in Virginia. And that's, uh, so I wrestled both uh, in the UK and the Department of Defense schools and also wrestled for um, Robinson Secondary School in Northern Virginia and then went off to um, went off to Colorado for school. I went to the Air Force Academy for my uh, bachelor's degree. So as a Falcon you began to understand the de that the demands of career of which you were uh, learning uh, as a student at Air Force and, a, and an officer there began to be uh, demands on your time and you had to make a decision do I continue wrestling and do I let study suffer how did, how did that decision come about well I think um, like any student going to college all of a sudden you were provided with a, a, 
a whole palette of opportunities and kind of narrowing those down, identifying your priorities, um, main, you know, identifying what goal, what it is that you want to accomplish and, and what's going to get you there. I think that any student is faced with that and, and, and certainly that is something that uh, I was faced with at the, the Air Force Academy as well. Uh, I wrestled, I walked onto the team and wrestled my first year at the Air Force Academy and, uh, and I think that the, the difference between the experience that I had in, uh, in high school um, and, and the experience that I had at the Academy was enough to make me to, you know, to seek out uh, something different. So ultimately, um, I uh, had done parachute training during the summer between my fr freshman and, and sophomore year and fell in love with that and, and ultimately uh, then joined the, the parachute team for the remaining three years at the Air Force Academy. Um, and, and I think that's one of the tremendous benefits of the Academy specifically, but college in general, is that uh, you really have the opportunity to find um, find your passion, find what it is that interests you um, and where you fit and, uh, and, and, and how that kind of fits into your, your future plans. Dr. Chell Lindgren joins us, astronaut. He's been to space twice, correct, Chell? Well, no, unfortunately, uh, only once at this point. Um, I launched in July, about this time last year, actually, and then landed in December, spent uh, 141 days in space, and it was a spectacular experience. Maybe I'm remembering how many spacewalks you had. That's right. I did, I did actually have the opportunity to do two, two spacewalks during my mission. All right. So here's, here's what kills me, okay, <laughs> Chell? <laughs> and from where I sit, okay, with my, uh, my degrees in public relations, marketing, and broadcast, you have a doctorate of medicine from the University of Colorado. You have an MS in cardiovascular physiology from Colorado State. You're a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy. You're an astronaut. I mean, dude, you went up and became a farmer. You expert. You became an expert in growing uh, a lettuce in space. That seems to me where, you, I mean, at some point you took a left at Albuquerque. What happened? Well, that was, uh, so getting to grow lettuce in space, that was a unique experience. Um, that was the veggie payload. And, uh, and I feel uh, it was such a privilege to get to be able to work on that scientific payload because um, not only was it amazing to get to grow a crop in space and to be the first U.S. crew to, to grow and eat a crop in space, um, but it, it's a, um, getting to grow the lettuce provided, of course, the nutri nutritional benefits and the psychologic, psychological benefits of tending to this crop on a daily basis for the same reasons that we garden back here on the earth, um, it was something that really captured the public's imagination while it was going on. And then ultimately though, the science is so important too. Uh, this is a technology that we're going to have to refine as we continue on our journey to Mars. As we identify how are we going to feed um, our crews uh, when they are on these missions that are lasting two or three years. Uh, and, and so instead of having to bring all of our food with us, this ability to grow crops en route uh, to provide uh, tasty and nutritious uh, uh, food stuff for that mission, I think is going to be critically important. And so it was really fun to be a part of, uh, of that scientific endeavor. Knowing you were going to do this, what kind of salad dressing went into space with Chell Lingren? Well, um, we actually didn't plan that far ahead. Uh, but we have vinegar and we have, uh, I'm sorry, we have a, a, yeah, balsamic vinegar and oil up there. So we made a quick uh, salad dressing out of that. And then I also took a piece of lettuce and slapped it onto one of um, the uh, faux cheeseburgers that uh, I was able to make. And uh, so that really completed that meal. Does lettuce taste better in space? It tastes terrific. You know, it tastes just like lettuce, which is a good thing, of course. If it did not taste like lettuce, then we did something uh, tragically and fundamentally wrong. Um, but one, getting to, to eat this fresh food up there, and, and fresh food is fairly scarce on the space station, uh, simply because most of our food is dehydrated or um, prepackaged, thermostabilized, uh, irradiated, which all sounds very delicious, of course. So getting to, to not only grow, but to eat this fresh food was, uh, was really a delight. Living in close proximity, as you do, to the many folks that populate uh, uh, the space missions, uh, there has to be a lot of forgiveness, I would imagine. But it presents some challenges, doesn't it? So, um, 
What do you mean? Well, you're living in pro close proximity to to other astronauts and other professionals, but very close. It's not like you're on. Maybe it is like you're in a wrestling room, or you know, sharing a mat space with a hundred other guys. But is, is it is it a challenge? No, you're. I so absolutely. You know. We all come into these missions, though, with the understanding that we're going to be very close um, confines. That uh, that we're going to have to get together. To we're going to have to work together to to be successful. And um, and so when you come into that, uh, come into a mission with that mentality, I think that uh, that you are prepared for the fact that you're going to be with the same people for an extended period of time within a confined space. And I think that we work very hard uh, with that understanding. We work very hard to, to be good teammates, to be good crew members to each other. And we describe that as expeditionary behavior, how to, to, to um, demonstrate good expeditionary behavior. And that means um, taking care of yourself, making sure that you've got everything squared away so that then you can look outward and, and see how can I make life better for my crewmates today? How can I make life easier on these guys? What can I do to improve their quality of life? And I think that if you have that mentality, that kind of a service mentality, um, that it really minimizes those friction points uh, because you're looking out for ways that you can not be annoying to people, ways that you can make other folks' um, life better. And when you have that type of approach, and everybody has that type of approach, you know, things go pretty well. And that's not to say that there aren't days when, you know, somebody's grumpy or, or uh, that there are some interpersonal conflicts. But, you know, to be completely honest, during my mission, th it was absolutely amazing. We had an amazing crew. Everybody got along really well. And, uh, and really, there weren't, were no interpersonal conflicts. Um, I am amazed because for the 141 days that I spent in space, my two U.S. crewmates in particular, who I saw and, you know, every day, uh, there's not a single day that I can remember where they were grumpy or upset. They were just even keeled um, and just a joy to work with. So they say when you go to space, you lose what two inches in height. You, we actually grow in height. You um, grow while you're in space. That's right, and that's because uh, you your your spine is not compressed by gravity as you stand up and so those inner vertebral discs that uh, that cush that are the cushions between the the vertebra those hydrate and uh, and extend the spine a little bit lengthen the spine and so i think i grew about an inch and a half i think scott grew two inches um, unfortunately we lose that height when we get back to the earth our spines compress and so all of that uh, that height extra height uh, disappears um, and that Lengthening and shortening, of course, does, comes at some expense. Um, your body is not used to that. So some folks, when they get into space, will have some low back discomfort. I think we all have some low back uh, soreness when we return back to the earth. And that's, I, I think, in some part due to the, the shortening of the spine and in some part due to just the um, having to support all of that body weight, that the, the weight of the torso, again, on the lower back. And that can be... A little uncomfortable initially, but uh, over time, that soreness fades away. Our guest, Dr. Chell Lindgren, uh, will be uh, at the at the NWCA convention. He'll be doing the keynote speech, and uh, I understand that there are still some seats available, but not many. Get a hold of the NWCA online at nwcaonline.com. Mike Moyer uh, is so pumped up that he has... Uh, Dr. Lindgren coming in. He is so excited, Joe. I can't even tell you. He said, you'll never guess who we got. And I said, who? And he told me. And I said, like a real astronaut? You know, not like a Don Knotts, but a real astronaut? And he goes, yeah, it's Chell Lindgren. I said, how'd that happen? So I'm looking forward to seeing it and uh, uh, getting a chance to see you uh, as well, Chell. It's just an absolute joy. But um, being able to talk to you today from the Houston Space Center, you've been back uh, since December um, and now you're on a new technical assignment. Can you tell us what that is in brief? Absolutely. So, you know, um, I was just talking with uh, some friends today and the question came up, what is it that, that uh, astronauts do in between missions? And, and that's very much where I am right now. I've returned back to the Earth. I've been home for about seven months. And uh, we spend the first month doing medical testing, reconditioning, data collection, the second month debriefing, speaking with all the teams that uh, support us in training and operations. And then the, the subsequent uh, three to four months, 
um, doing appearances, going out and talking about our experiences, sharing our experiences uh, um, from our missions. And uh, once we're done with that post-flight period, we take up this technical job, and I'll be working in the, the International Space Station Integration Branch in the payloads office. And my job will be to work with uh, the teams that support our science and our payloads, the teams that work with the principal investigators, the scientists and engineers, um, really to make sure that those payloads are all uh, have been refined and that the procedures, the payloads, the equipment itself are all ready to go, ready to be deployed on the space station and ready for our uh, amazing uh, space station crews to, to go to work on those. Chow Ling again, our guest. And Chow, I've got to ask you, and this I don't want you to think this is a silly or stupid question. You go into space, there's some expectations, you're going to see space de debris. Did you see space debris? Well, we don't see space debris um, with our with our uh, the naked eye, and that's because we're traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. If a piece of debris is coming at us, it's traveling at 17,500 miles per hour, which adds up to a, a super high velocity. And so in the blink of an eye, it would have already come towards us. What we do see, though, during our spacewalk uh, specifically, is the effects of that space debris. And so the space station is actually constantly being struck by very small pieces of, uh, of uh, space junk, flecks of paint, um, and, and that sort of thing. And you can actually, while you're out on the spacewalk, see areas where uh, this debris has struck the space station and really kind of created this splash sandblast pattern that has knocked the paint away. In some places you can actually see these little miniature craters that have been, that are, represent where the, the, the metal has been um, almost molten and, and splashed up, creating very sharp edges. And of course, we have to look out the, for those because we don't want to rub our gloves across these sharp edges, which could, could cut our gloves and, and uh, create a, a, a leak of pressurization. Um, so you can see those effects. The larger pieces of space de debris are actually tracked by our colleagues in, the, in, in Space Command, and they will alert Mission Control anytime that there's a concern for a collision or in NASA parlance, a conjunction. And if there's a high probability of a conjunction with one of these larger pieces of, uh, of space junk or space debris, we will actually maneuver the space station out of the way. We'll increase its orbit and, and basically fly it out of the path of that, uh, that debris. It's a, this is a, it's a huge issue. It's a serious problem, um, the amount of debris that's in space right now. And it's, so we have folks that are looking forward to how do we do operations in space? When folks are launching satellites and, and deep space probes, how can we be good uh, stewards of low Earth orbit and minimize the amount of debris that's generated uh, so that we can keep um, the, the crew members that are living in space and the, the assets that all of our, uh, the, our international partners have in space. Uh, weather satellites, communication satellites, keep those all healthy. That's got to be a huge concern for those that are actually going outside uh, the facilities, whether it's the International Space Center or the, the I don't know all the terms that we use, but all the vehicles and, and platforms that you're on, but when you go outside in your uh, spacewalk uniform, uh, the, the setup, I gotta believe that's a huge concern. You mentioned rubbing your hand over a rough surface, your glove, and, and being concerned about a tear. How about a piece of uh, a space debris that, that hits, hits the uniform? I gotta believe that is a real big concern. It is definitely a concern. I think the risk of that happening is fairly low, um, but it's certainly something that we think about. The, the spacesuit is specifically built with a uh, very tough fabric um, that can resist uh, a micrometeorite strike like that. But, uh, but we also have procedures. You know, if, if the suit is, is uh, damaged in a way that um, inhibits its ability to continue to provide good, uh, good atmosphere or good protection, um, we will be notified, you know, the suit will let us know and we'll, we'll head into the airlock. If there's a hole that's punctured in the suit, uh, there is a backup emergency oxygen supply that can continue to pressurize the suit and give us enough, enough oxygen uh, for 30 minutes to make it back into the airlock as well. So these are things that, uh, that our engineers have certainly thought about and things that we train to as uh, we prepare for, for that type of uh, spacewalk. Chow, what, what is the strangest question, having addressed so many different groups, audiences, and age groups as well? Strangest question, perhaps, you've ever been uh, asked about your time with NASA? Strangest question I've ever been asked. That's a tough one. Um, I don't, you know, 
ultimately all the que there are there are really no kind of dumb questions because it is such a foreign environment um, that there are some questions that are that are very simple or very complex they, they go the whole range but they really reveal uh, the interest of the audiences and what it is that we do in space and it's such a unique environment um, that we are we are absolutely eager to to share our experiences and the perspective that we have uh, from from being on space being in space for such a long period of time. When we sent Voyager up, if you recall, yeah. there was a gold disc attached to the uh, the exterior, and the gold disc had messages from around the world in a variety of languages, music, a lot of things were embedded in this disc. Dr. Sagan, I think, had. Uh, a great idea in that should it be encountered by other life forms from other solar systems or what have you, we would have at least have made the attempt to communicate with them. Mm -hmm. Did you see any signs when you're in low Earth orbit or anywhere in space, Doctor? <laughs> Did you see any signs of having uh, other life out there? Um, I did not see any alien life. Um, I did see some of my crewmates come out of their crew quarters early in the morning and uh, get sleeping bag hair up there. So um, that's about as close as uh, I came to seeing a, a, um, alien life. Um, it is an amazing perspective that we have from the International Space Station. It's amazing to look back at, uh, at our incredible home planet, absolutely beautiful um, planet, the Earth, but also to be able to look um, beyond the Earth, to look at the horizons, to see the aurora, um, and to see constellations, and to see the moon and the planets rising, just like they, we can see them uh, rising on Earth. Um, the one striking thing that, uh, I, I guess the scene that struck me the most, um, and, and continued to, to make an impression on me day after day, is that when you look out the window and you see um, the cosmos, you know, the, the stars that surround us uh, and just the beauty of that, the emptiness of the, the solar system. And we talk about, you know, can there be life on other worlds? Um, what do those other worlds look like? And, you know, we don't know the answer to that. We don't know the answer to that. Is, are there life, is there life on other planets? But the thing that we do know for, for sure is that there is life on our planet. And our planet is um, absolutely beautiful, absolutely unique. Uh, in our experience and in our perspective from the space station. Um, and it is one of a kind. It is fragile and it is finite. And, uh, and you really get the sense that this, the Earth is our species um, spaceship, that we are all crew members living and working on uh, this incredible uh, spaceship Earth and that we have to do a better job taking care of it. When we live on the space station, we immediately recognize, you have the, the, the overwhelming sense is that if you don't take care of the space station, if you're careless and bump into a, a window, um, if you, if you uh, break a piece of the equipment, if you do not take care of the space station, at some point in the very near, near future, it is going to fail to take care of you. We recognize it as a refuge um, in the cold void of space. And I think that uh, as, a, as a species, we have to have a better recognition of the fact that the Earth is the exact, uh, requires the exact same care, that we have to take care of this very finite and fragile resource, um, or sometime in the future, it's, it's not going to be able to take care of us uh, like it is right now. Very special thank you to our friend Kim Nahas there at the Johnson Space Center. Also want to thank our guest. He's been very gracious with his time. His knowledge is exceptional, and his ability to motivate me is phenomenal. I'm having lettuce for dinner tonight in a heartbeat. Chow, I hope you have a great time in Florida at the NWCA National Leadership Council and Convention, and I hope uh, reacquainting yourself as deeply as you will with the sport of wrestling will be as gratifying for you as it is for those that will be sitting there watching you. Thank you so much, Scott. It was great, uh, great chatting with you. For all of us at Takedown and for our friends at NASA, I'm Scott Casper for Takedown Wrestling. Our guest in the Nike hot seat today, Dr. Chell Lindgren. He's a for real astronaut. And that's what I'm talking about. Chell, thank you. <laughs>